please everybody stand up. So I am Shai. Uh, that's my internet presence is Shy Guitar. Uh, I actually play guitar. I have a band I play with on the weekends. We play some jazz. That's a picture of my guitar. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this is because they say every presentation needs you know, a story to kind of engage the audience. And so my story is going to be building an API for a music label company. You guys hear me all right? I don't know. You guys hear me? Yep. Okay. So uh, this company is going to have a server developer. Uh, we're going to have a client library developer that's going to develop a client that's going to consume that API. And we'll have an app developer, you might notice is Jacob. Um, but uh, he will be using that client in his, uh, in his app in order to consume that server API that we're going to be creating. So just to kind of get a quick overview, we're going to create a server API that's going to have a get and a, and a post. Right, we're going to have a get song by name. We're, our domain model is going to have a name and words. And we can either get it by the name, or we can post to songs and create a new song with a certain title and uh, specific words that we you know, decide to use. And the client that's going to actually consume that API is going to look something like this. Is it'll have the client, we instantiate a new uh, client of that library. We can have a post song method on that client, pass the title of the song and the words. And then if we get the song, which will use that get HTTP method, that get request, um, we can get those words back. That's going to be the client interface. And the goal of, or at least a very important part of my talk, is going to be how we create this mocking mode um, that Jacob had mentioned earlier in his presentation um, that we can use in a third party app that's using that client, very similar to the fog mock that he had uh, presented. So, something that's very fast and in memory that we can use that doesn't actually consume the real API but behaves like it. So he'll, it'll be something like this. We'll have a client.mock, and we'll have the same methods that he can use. And then if he uses it, it'll all be in memory, not really consuming our APIs in their tests, in his tests, um, but everything behaving as it should. So yeah, just a quick overview. Uh, create an API musicians can use to source songs. Uh, build a client library that we're going to use in consumer applications. And those consumer applications are going to use them. And we want to make sure that it's easy to test with them in, the, in those applications. OK, so uh, how do we test APIs? Uh, this is the natural progression that I have found uh, when I was working on this and what I've seen many other people do. Um, and I'm, sh there's sh I'm sure there's a lot of other approaches. Uh, I would be more than glad to hear your experience. And please see me after the talk. That would be great. Because uh, I'm very interested in the subject. And I think it's, it's a lot more complicated than you would initially think. So um, the, the first one I'm going to talk about is isolated testing, or actually, um, so there's isolated testing. I'm going to run through that real quick. Uh, sandboxes, fake servers, and mappers. So I'm going to go right into it. Um, the first natural thing you do when you want to code a server is you say, OK, I'm going to code the server. I'm going to test it. I mean, you can do it TDD style or whatever. But the idea is you're going to test the server. And then when you build the client, we're going to code the client, test the client. And each one of them we're going to do in their own special little context. right? Like, So we'll have something. My computer moved to the next slide. Uh, we would code the server uh, with a the same thing that I, we showed in the beginning. We'd have a post and a get method. Um, we would render the JSON back. Um, if they managed to successfully post a song, we would render an OK back. Um, and we would render the words in you know, a JSON kind of words hash if they want to get the song according to the title. So the server test would look something like this. We'd have a setup that we would set the browser. Um, the browser would actually just u go explicitly to those uh, controller actions, and we would test that we get the response that we expect. Um, if we post a song, we'll get that OK. And if we you know, try to get it back, we'll get the words for that song. Um, so yeah, this is, the, this is how it would look like. Um, and in the client, we would have the method that we showed beforehand. We'd have like a get song on the client. Um, and that would basically try, basically go ahead and get the, the uh, would go and get the, uh, the, the get action, right, for get song. It would parse the JSON and take out the words from the words hash that was passed back in 
and give it, give it back to whoever's using that client. Right? And the test would look something like this. Um, we would basically make sure that if we post a song and we get it back, we get the words that we posted for those same exact words. Right? Except for the setup, we would need to use something like fake whip, or essentially we would need to mock out the server. Um, and this really shows where this approach kind of crumbles, um, because we're mocking out the server and there's no actual real integration that's done between the client and the server. Because we're actually using fake web, we're not actually hitting up the controller and testing from the client what the server is giving back. There's, there's just no integration done between the two, and that's it's not, not great. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we know that the client behaves the way it should be according to its own interface. We know the server is doing what it should be doing, but we don't know that the client talking to the server is actually doing what it should be doing. Uh, explicitly, if we changed our server API, the client test would still pass, even though the, the behavior should be that they would fail. And so, you know, the client library developer would be unhappy, to say the least. So, um, so the next kind of evolution from that is uh, having uh, a sandbox running somewhere, right? We have the server, we developed it, and we actually put it somewhere on the internet where we could use, or you could also put it on a local host or whatever you want if you were in development. Um, and we could actually use the client to hit up that sandbox, right? We can see, okay, we want to actually go through the server code, so we're going to put it somewhere, we're going to run the client against the sandbox, and, and then we'll have this integration between the two. So the server development is still the same, and we're going test to the, test the client against the real server code. Um, it would look something like this, and we would have the domain that we would pass in of where we're going to actually um, make those requests, and we're going to have the same exact tests um, make sure that we, we make our assertions and that should work and everything should be great, right? Um, and if the server API changes, the client's going to fail and that's, that's kind of what we want. The, the, the couple of problems are that um, setting up a sandbox takes time, right? You need to set up the dependencies. I mean, things like Heroku and Engine Yard make these a lot easier. You can just kind of set it up and go. But um, the truth is that it's a hassle, right? It steps in your way of development. You want to kind of code real quick and this is just something that you need to do especially if you've got dependencies and stuff, it's kind of annoying. Um, and also, every time that you, I mean, if you're in early stages of development, right, you want really quick iterations. And if you change your server, right, you want to actually see that immediately when you're developing the client. And so in order to do that, you need to, because we're, we're running against the sandbox, we need to make sure that, those, that the server is up to date all the time. And so having frequent releases when you're developing early and you want really quick iterations is problematic and kind of hinders development. Um, but m I think most importantly, I mean, we're making real requests, right? We're, we're not mocking out because we want full integra integration between the two. And so the real requests of the sandbox slow down the client tests. So the whole point of testing is we want really quick iterations and we don't get it because we make real requests. Um, also, something that has come up many times when we were testing against sandboxes is, you know, what if we want uh, to have a validation for a song and we want to say that a song has a unique title, right? Like, if that song has already been created, you can't post the same song again because there'll be a, a, a data conflict. I mean, there's gonna be a data constraint. And the problem with sandboxes is you're gonna run the client test once, and it's gonna try and talk to the sandbox the first time it'll pass, but then afterwards we already created that song, and we will run into unique data conflict, and the test will fail, even though theoretically they should have passed, right? Um, also, complicated tests are difficult, um, especially if you don't have a complete API in the servers. Um, for example, the data that was left there um, in the sandbox can, we don't have a way to delete it, right? Let's say, let's say we do have access to the sandbox and we can just drop the database and recreate it, that's good. But if we were developing a client against a sandbox that we didn't have access to, for example, if we were developing a client against, you know, some other service that was giving us a sandbox, we, we wouldn't have access to that. And if we didn't have a API that was available, available for us to clean the state of the server, we can't really do anything. We're really stuck. Um, and moreover, I mean, you can get, it, it gets really slow. I mean, if you have complicated tests like, you know, we want to create 50 songs to check to see that after 50 songs, a current user can't have more than 50 because that's just the limit of how many songs you can create. We're going to have to do, 50, in, the, in our setup and teardown test, we're going to have to create all these things, it takes a lot of time, and you don't necessarily have, like I mentioned before, you don't have necessarily have the ability to clean up that in your teardown. So complicated tests are even sometimes impossible, not to say the least. And that, that's no good, really, for a server and client library developer. Um, 
And also, to touch back to the previous goal of having a mock mode, there's really no fixtures we ship with a client. So if we do something like this, we're going to actually ship it out, um, but the app server that's going to use our client is going to have to mock out the, the client itself in their own app in order to have really fast tests. And that doesn't, that's, that's the, not really helpful. So Jacob's sad. Um, although it, it is it's useful to note that it's not bad. Um, in many cases, when you're going to be developing clients against APIs, you won't necessarily have the privilege of developing a client for a server that you have control over. Um, so you're going to be stuck with something like this. But um, also, I mean, it's, it's much better than testing in isolation, right? We have a full integration path. You're actually seeing that the client is talking to the server and behaving in the way it should be. Um, and that's, that's good. And so it's just worth noting that so far this is, is really the best thing. Um, to step it up a little bit, kind of on the previous goal of how, how are we going to create a mock mode, right? So um, fake servers is something that Jacob had mentioned, I think, a little bit. I, didn't, I don't think he expanded on it, but I'll kind of try and, and give a quick concept. Um, so the server portion on the left is basically the Rails app, right? And as you can see, there's all this crazy stuff that's going on. We have background jobs that are firing. We're doing statistics. We're making external API requests, maybe. We're, we're doing all this crazy stuff. And in the client, right, we're going to have a fake server that's going to mimic that. And I think Jacob mentioned that he did that in the spikes. Um, and the fake server is going to behave like the, 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 um, the, the real Rails application, except it's not going to do anything except, except implement the behavior of that API, right? It doesn't care about all the internal implementation of, OK, it fires a background job, it does this, it does that. All it cares is that if we post to a song, it'll create it. And if we get to the song, we'll be able to get it back, right? So it's small, that's big, and that's kind of the, the idea of fake servers. And just to zoom in a little bit, right, well, we want it to be fast, so we're going to be in memory. We'll use something like a hash or an array or whatever you want. And we'll make sure to do all our logic all in memory. Sorry about that. Right? And then we'll have the same, the same behavior as a real API. If we get the song according to the name, we'll just be able to pull it out of the hash, turn it into JSON, and send it back. And that's exactly what the server is doing. So yeah, we want it to mirror the, the real API. Um, we want it to be as slim as possible. We want the code to be really slim. Also, uh, something I didn't mention on that slide is you know, it would be useful to use Sinatra for something like a fake server, right? Because we want it to be really simple, low dependencies. Sinatra is a perfect use case for something like that. Um, we want it to be in memory, to be zippy fast, um, ensure low dependencies so that we can include it in other projects that we're going to be using that fake server with no ha you know, apparent hassle. Um, and when we're developing and using the fake servers, what we're going to end up doing is say, okay, when we're developing really quickly, when we want to develop the client against the server, we're going to use this fake application, and we're going to develop really rapidly, really fast. But when we're going to push it to our CI server, we're going to run it against something like a sandbox, right? We're going we're gonna to run it, um, and it'll take a long time, um, and it'll... You know, it's going to be something like a, a test suite could uh, compare to 10 seconds if we have these fake web servers and, you know, like 5, 10, 15 minutes running actually real requests and doing the real stuff against something that's, that's really running, you're hitting the real code and not something fake. And the beauty of, of using something like this is that you get all the, the, the benefits of having fast iteration, but you know that it's going to, that the fake is going to mimic, is going to actually... It actually um, behaves exactly like the real server because we know that if one of them fails, then the APIs are not compatible. Right? And this is probably the most important slide uh, that I have here to understand because we, want, we know we get all the benefits of using something fake with the valid, valid um, you know, with the confidence that we know that it's actually doing exactly what the real server is doing. Um, and it's pretty amazing because you get all this, all this good stuff and you with none of the bad, pretty much, or, or close to none. Um, so yeah, well, in specifically, what we um, have used is something like an uh, environment variable, and in our CI server, we'll set that variable um, and run it in you know a fake mode or a real mode or whatever it is that we you know that we're doing. So yeah, the fake is validated by our real run mode. Um, local development of clients quick. We still have full integration. And that's that's pretty amazing. Um, and uh, more so, our consumer applications can use this fake server in their own application, right? And they, and because we know that the fake server actually mimics the real server because we've run it twice, 
um, then we know that when we use this, when they use it in their application, right, they can use something like client.mock, which is very similar to what Fog has or other mock, uh, top, toggle mock um, libraries have. And then when they write their own test for their own application and they use the interface of the client, it's all going to happen in that fake server, right? And the beauty of this is that it happens really quickly, but we also know that it's mirroring our real API, and that's, it's, it's really great. Um, and that gets to a really good app developer that's going to be consuming this client library. Um, server developers are always happy, apparently. Um, and uh, the problem with this, or at least the, the slight problem, is um, that there are more steps for a client because we need to maintain the fake server, right? We always need to make sure that if we add features to the server, we need to make sure that the uh, fake is updated. Um, and so I wouldn't say that the client library developer is sad, but there is a little bit more work uh, that needs to be done there. Um, and you know, it's just trade-offs, right? Programming is all about trade-offs, and um, so far I think this is probably uh, better, but you know, like I mentioned earlier, that you won't always get the privilege of, of, of working in the way you want, right? Sometimes you'll need to develop against something, sometimes you only do the server and not the client. So this is just a, a very specific scenario. So um, the last kind of thing I'm going to talk about is the mapper style. It's something that we've used um, at Engine Yard. I haven't really seen it used anywhere else. Um, it's dependent on um, specific libraries and such, and I'll try and touch base real soon, but I'll, I'll run real quick through it. But the, the main idea is that instead of having two separate places that we're going to have a real API and then a fake API, we're going to have one repository that's going to hold both of them um, and we're just going to, to use a module to define whether it's going to be fake behavior or real behavior and then map it accordingly exactly like the, uh, the fake example. All right, so we're going to have one place, one repository where that APA is defined, the post and get definitions, and in that repository we're also going to have the client interface and a fake mapper which is essentially that module that's going to pretend to be the fake app. Um, and the mappers, read together mappers in both API repository code and server with, which map between fake and real implementation, those, those mappers um, that I kind of am citing, uh, those mappers are basically the module that defines whether or not it's real or fake. And we can use that repository um, with Rack to, because, because it's Rack, we can mount Rack applications atop, on top of one in, uh, another and so we can mount that shared API definitions in our Rails app or whatever our server app is. Um, and, and it looks something like this. Um, I, I just wanted to know real quick, there's um, a repository that I'm going to uh, include in the appendix and you guys can see all these things. Um, there's fully working tests, um, fully working examples of all these things and I encourage you to check them out and you know, touch base with me afterwards and if you have any questions or anything like that. Um, so uh, we'll have, you know, I'm just going to run through it quick, but the idea is that we're going to have this server.mapper in this one place that we define our API, and that mapper is essentially the module that we're going to include to say, okay, this is either fake or this is either real, right? And then the rest, like JSON is something that both of them, um, whether it's real or fake, we know we need to do, we can put in this one place that's dry, and then later we can use something like the fake mapper to assign to this server.mapper thing, right? Um, so we're gonna define a fake mapper, which is essentially very similar to the, the, the fake implementation. Um, it's usually thinner. I mean, in, in real usage, it's, it's a bit thinner, okay? Um, and we have the same exact idea with the real mapper, which we're gonna put in our Rails application, um, and in there we'll have access to all in our internal models, all our, the current user, you know, we could do all the things we needed to do in the real implementation because we have that module inside our app. And then when we actually end up mounting it, we'll, assi we'll assign the mapper to whether or not it's the real implementation or the fake implementation. All right, so um, if this is our Rails app, we can just do application routes draw and then assign it and then mount it. So happy people all around. Um, and the consumer application can still use the the app, just like the fake server, right, using like a mock. Um, and that's still a bonus. It's a little bit more dry. Uh, okay. And uh, in our fake example, like in their consumer applications that want to use it, we just assign the same thing, right? We assign the fake one to the mapper, we, we mount it, and they can use the mock method and use our thing, use the get song client interface and we still are using the fake implementation, we're using the 
hash, right? This is all happening in memory fast, and we know that it's validated because we're running it twice, right? The same exact thing like we've done before. So we have uh, fixtures and fixtures that we can ship, and that's pretty awesome. The guy's happy. We still have full integration. It's a little bit more dry. Um, the a couple problems with this one is that yeah, there's specific library dependencies. Um, rack line is one of them. There's a few more, I think, if I remember. Um, and uh, more importantly, it's a little convoluted in the very beginning. If you don't really know this pattern, it's not as easy to kind of dive head in and maintain and enhance it. Uh, but if you do, there's, of course, the advantages that it's a lot uh, more dry and, and, and just a lot more isolated. Um, so every internet tech talk needs a cat in it, so I put a cat in there. And this might be what you're feeling and thinking, because I went through a lot of different um, things, or hopefully it is, because there's a lot of uh, stuff to go through. Um, and, uh, but I want to go through some conclusions. Uh, APIs are the foundation of distributed systems, and that's kind of why I put the tweet in. I think it's uh, really representative of, of, of our current time. I think it's... Uh, so so this, this talk is... I feel is very relevant. Um, and testing an API is, is a lot more uh, interesting than it seems at first, right? Because we have different systems. Um, they're all talking to each other. And we're not testing one specific system. We have to test how they all work. And integration tests are hard. So, um, And yeah, there are many approaches. I'd, I'd love to hear your experience with how you guys test APIs um, and what you know and, and have learned over the course of the last years. And um, please come see me and talk to me about it. Um, and yeah, just a quick, you know, kind of reiteration that uh, validated fakes are and mock modes are are great, and I would say even essential for local client development. It's also great for using them in different applications, right? So this is the repository that I mentioned uh, that you can uh, you see all these different approaches. I'm actually used Sinatra instead of a Rails app, but it all kind of just works. So you can check it out, run the tests, and play around with it. Um, quick shout out to Jacob. Um, this talk was also kind of um, came came up through working on the add-on system that we uh, were developing, um, and uh, you should guys check that out too. Um, Rack client, fake web, real web, Sinatra, some gems you should check out um, in general. Uh, there's another talk uh, that's done by a coworker of mine that's uh, somewhat similar. It's a little different, but you should see it if you're interested in the subject. Um, I'll put the slides on the internet, and thank you. Questions? Questions? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Well, I mean, it depends on, on the amount of time that... You, I mean, you essentially should do the test, right? If you want that, you need to add that in, right? I mean, that's that's the, the hard part about having a fake server is that you need to maintain it. I mean, there's not really a way around it. Um, if you want a mock mode, you know, that's just a trade-off that you'll need to do. But there, th considering the other... Uh, drawbacks that other approaches have, I would say it's, it's the lesser evil, so, yeah. Any more?